Let me give you a verse. This is the first city we've been to in 19 cities where God gave me a verse for what was supposed to happen in this meeting. And it's Isaiah 44, 3. I'm gonna read it in the Amplified Classic. I dare you to write this down. For I will pour water upon him who is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offering, of your offspring. Look at that. And my blessings upon your descendants. How many of you have a few descendants that need some blessing? This is Texas. This is the western side of Texas. We, lead, we need water out here, don't we? We don't need just physical water. We need the water of the Holy Spirit. That's what we're going to do. Now, you may have come tonight. You came tonight thinking this is going to be a political rally. We've been places where the pastor of the church got up and said, this isn't a political rally. It's a church meeting. I'm like, well, it kind of is. But the reality is, and I said it earlier, and I want you to understand this overarching theme of everything we talk about this weekend. The answer to America is not political, it's spiritual. It's spiritual. And it's not just a spiritual change, it's what we need here in Texas as we enter in these summer months and what we need all over across America is we need the rain. We need the rain of revival. And I can hear it now. Can you hear it? It's the sound of revival.
I want to go down the list here. I'm going to let Lance go last. And Rick, you go first. Give us the uh, synopsis of where we are in America today. Go. Well, it's interesting. You said unity. And of course, two weeks ago, Tony was talking about unity and they are trying to tear us apart. They're doing everything they can to keep us from unifying, even within our own ranks within the church. And so I think the, the spirit of, uh, of that that idea that we will get past denominational lines and all of our differences and start looking at what we can do together, which the founding fathers had to do the exact same thing. So we're literally in the same boat that they are. And uh, I think everything they're doing to Trump right now in the, in the trial is actually creating unity among us. It's bringing people together that wouldn't normally come together. Right. Um, but we see, the, we see the dysfunction in the House, right, among our own folks and a lot of folks that, that we all, you know, uh, support and, and, and appreciate. And so there is a real battle for this. And I appreciate what you said earlier, Gene. It is absolutely got to be spiritual first, and the political will be downstream from that. And uh, so I'm just thrilled that that theme of unity is still coming. I think we're going to hear a lot more of that tonight. Everybody pray for those members like Nate that are in real battles right now in Texas to create some unity in the House, but not cave on the issues. So just because you see these guys having to go at it, sometimes we have to have a family squabble to have the standards and stand up for the things that are right. And so let's have wisdom and discernment in those battles. Amen. All right, let me, uh, let me introduce Pastor Nate Schatzlein, who's also Texas House Representative. Thank you so much, Gene. Guys, I'm so excited to be with you tonight. Uh, you know, it's been just bizarre. I've been a pastor my whole life, and it wasn't until three years ago I felt like the Holy Spirit called me and my wife to run for office. And uh, by the grace of God, we won, and I'm now proud to represent Fort Worth in the Texas House, fighting for our values, fighting for faith, family, and freedom. And. Uh, what Rick said is right, and what Gene said earlier is spot on, is we are not in a political battle, we are in a spiritual battle. Do you believe that? And if we believe that, then we have to approach this spiritually as well. You know, no one else is coming to save us. We are the answer and the solution. And I truly believe this, the answer is not a new law, it's revival happening in our yes. capital today. I believe that we have to see an infilling of the Holy Spirit with politicians. I don't know about you, but I am tired of politicians prostituting the church for a vote and not sharing our values and fighting for them when they get there. And so I believe we have to unify absolutely, but let me be clear, what we unify around is just as important as what we unify with. And I'm telling you right now, we are disunifying with the evils that are coming against us in the state of Texas. And we're taking a stand for our values at every turn. All right. All right, this guy you're going to like. James Ward, Chicago, to bring it to the heat. Yes, sir. It's good to be here. Hello, hello, Texas. You know, this theme of unity is so powerful. We've heard the scripture that tells us that one can chase a 1,000, but two can chase 10,000. I thought for the longest, God is not that good at addition. But <laughs> that speaks to the force multiplier of the power of unity and what Psalm 103 calls the commanded blessing. And as we come together in unity in the name of Jesus, the church is about to walk into the commanded blessing. There is no devil in hell. There's no force in hell that can stop the church of Jesus Christ. This time is so powerful when you're talking about government. The church is superior to the government. We're talking about the kingdom of God. This is not right versus left. This is right versus wrong. This is light versus darkness. And I'll leave you with this in Luke chapter 3. It says that in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar and Pontius Pilate was governor in Judea and Herod was Tetrarch in, Tetrarch in Galilee and Philip was Tetrarch and they were all government positions. They were all, had, all had power. Annas and Caiaphas were high priests in the land. But the Bible says that the word of the Lord came to John the Baptist in the wilderness. These are the kind of places where God is going to begin to speak to shape the destiny of the nation. Be encouraged, the revival is not coming. It's already here, it's already here. Amen. All right, Pastor Tony from Tennessee. Amen. Early this morning, Come on. I heard the Lord say, it's gonna rain. Yeah. 
And I kept hearing that all morning long as I tried to find a plane that would actually come and land in Lubbock, Texas for the meeting tonight. They wanted to send me to Charlotte and Dallas and somehow Birmingham for some random reason. And I finally made it. But all day long, I kept hearing the Lord say, it's going to rain. It's going to rain. And then I heard you talking about the rain. And it reminded me because I'm a, I'm a Chicago boy, born and raised in Chicago. And when I moved out to the country, I don't know anything about farms. I don't know anything about ranches. I wear loafers. I didn't know, that, I didn't know anything about all that. And they took me out to a farm and blue, beautiful blue sky. And we're out there looking at this farm, and that old farmer said, he said, it's going to rain. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. And so I asked him, I said, how do you know? He said, I smell it. I got one message for Lubbock tonight. It's going to rain. This is my kind of meeting. I smell the abundance of Holy Ghost rain that's going to fall tonight. It's going to fall tomorrow. I hope you came ready for Holy Ghost revival because God said, I'm sending Come the on. rain to Lubbock, Texas. Woo! It's going to happen in the spirit. It's going to happen in the natural. I feel Holy Ghost rain about to fall. You ought to praise him right now. Come on. Amen. Pastor Lance Wallnow. Gene, you know, one of the challenges that I have is that um, you invite me here because we have these spirited kind of prophetic dialogues about what's happening in America, and we do news analysis. Yes, we do. Then you bring me into a revival meeting with worship and rain. <laughs> And, you know, it's a little bit of whiplash for a guy like me because, you know, I'm ready to go in one direction, but I am Pentecostal. Amen. So I'm a little drunk in the spirit right now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I want you to know there really is already an outpouring of rain is here. The early, the early rain's already here. Some of you will pick up with the latter rain later on in the meeting. But in the name of Jesus, the Bible says, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And that church that you're hearing talked about that can go up like this young man up against the legislative gates of hell or pastor in Chicago or raise up a new generation of, of, of litigators and legislators or be able to lead media or evangelize like this. Every department in this room has got to be engaged in the battle, and you need to be filled with the Spirit to do it right. Amen. You're going to have to be filled with the Holy Ghost. So as you prayed tonight for the prodigals, Gene, I said, I just sat back, and how many of you have a prodigal and we were opening our hands up or not or praying for someone that does? And I realized America is the prodigal nation. That's right. Our, our national identity is really right now drifting. I mean, when you've got military professionals dressed in skirts and you've got um, abortion discussed in the ninth month and you've got, you know, Hamas on your campus and Jew hating Jews is becoming popular, something so bizarre and alien to the roots of our identity is taking hold that it's like an infection that's got to work its way out like a fever. And I believe the body of Christ is called for the deliverance ministry. We're called to be deliverers. So you're not just a spectator passing through. For all the times that we talk about the church, you know, America, uh, let's see, the church can make it without America, but America can't make it without the church. Remember this, that, that sounds good. It's a great preacher line. But you and your kids are stuck in the place that can't make it without the church. So the church is going to change the situation in America, Gene. That's right. And it's going to have to be a revival church. But it's a church like we didn't grow up with, engaged in every gate of influence. Because what you don't occupy, the devil will occupy and use against you. So welcome to the new awakening. It's a lot of fun. Give him a hand, would you? Lance Wall now. Hello, hello. Thank you, thank you. Yes, Gene and I have, we've been building a relationship over the years from our early days of his abuse. 
Well, this is an interesting podium to work from. <laughs> and I'd like to share with you how to get a good sermon. All right, so for these, those of you that are online that won't be here tomorrow for our secret meeting, you see what we do in Flashpoint on the Road is we have secret meetings. And I am uh, speaking at the secret meeting tomorrow, which isn't broadcast. But I'm going to tell you the point of the secret meeting tomorrow. Watch the fan turn the pages. All right, if you've got a Bible, this will be brief, but I, want you to, I don't want you to miss this. Acts 27, how many of you really sense that America is a prodigal nation? Now, how did the prodigal son, your prodigal children, the prodigals you're praying for, here's the funny thing, I remember a preacher told me once, when you're praying for your prodigal husband, prodigal son, prodigal whatever, the temptation is to intervene, to get them out of their misery. But he said something I'll never forget. He said, don't fix the fix that God fixed to fix them. <laughs> in other words, if someone's in a fix or a difficult place, don't fix it. How many of you ever bailed someone out only to have them go back in again and again and again? And the Lord finally says, stop. Why? Because there's a certain education that comes from the consequences of bad choices. And America has spent $35 trillion in order to keep itself from experiencing the consequences of stupid policies and ideas. At some point, we'll go broke as a nation, not a negative confession, an economic calculus. At some point, you run out of money. Or 30 or 40 nations get together and decide they're not going to accept your dollar anymore because they think you're fiscally irresponsible and your house is on fire. That's where America's at right now. Here's what I want to tell you. The prodigal nation, like a prodigal son, can only come to itself when it's experienced enough reality therapy that it realizes it needs to change. You've got to toughen up, church, because you're on board the ship. Whether they like it or not, they don't know who we are. They put movies out on us. They call us Christian nationalists, terms that we never use, by the way. They put on us. They have all kinds of paranoia about what we represent, but still, their deliverance is the fact that we're on board the ship. And the proof of that is a great story, and it's in the book of Acts, where the Apostle Paul is stuck on board a ship. And what I want to do right now is I want to talk to you about how to connect your life, your giving, your offering of yourself to the Lord so that it brings deliverance to you and your family. That's what we've got to learn. Paul was on board a ship he didn't want to be on. He told them to make better decisions. They overruled his decisions. He knew what they needed to do, but they didn't want to listen to it because it was a fanatical rabbi in the basement, and he was on his way to Rome for a trial anyway. They had a brand on him. He didn't have any equity on board that ship. However, when the cargo got lost, and they got caught in the storm, and they feared for their own lives, they remembered the fanatic that told them, they should have stayed in the port because if they took off and didn't do what he said, they could possibly experience the loss of life. And sure enough, Paul, in this one great verse, a pivotal verse that I pray happens in America and happens in every home, Acts 27, 24, an angel comes and answers Paul's intercession, his apostolic travail on board that crazy ship. And the angel breaks through and says, Fear not, Paul, you must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God has given to you all them that are now sailing with you. What an interesting shift. The moment the angel came on board, it was as though God said, up until now, you were a hostage on their nutty ship. From now on, they're a hostage on board your destiny. You've got to go to Rome, so God's going to save them. Let me tell you something. The secret sauce for saving America is the unfinished assignment of Christians in America. God will save this ship because your work isn't done in the earth. Let me say that again. That ship would have gone down and just been a footnote in some Wikipedia article, except that Paul had a prophetic word that his face was in the future in Rome. One time I was at a meeting where uh, Kim Clement and I were about to go, great prophet of God. We were going to Detroit, and we're on our way to Detroit. And, and just a week before we got there, we were going to be introducing prophetic ministry. The pastor wanted prophetic ministry to the church. He was breaking the church open to understand the prophets are real. 
and a woman who had been instrumental in opening the door of the church to the prophetic message. She died two weeks before the prophetic conference started. Ooh, that's not a great way to start your prophetic church. So the senior pastor called up and said, how do I explain this? Well, one of the uh, prophets went there. I think it was Bill Hammond was there the first week, and Kim Clement and I were there the second week. And he said, I understand, sister, so-and-so just passed away. She prayed for 30 years for this church to be opened up to the prophetic. And I'm going to tell you something. I took a look at her prophecies. She actually kept them and prayed. Prayed according to the prophecies. And her testimony was that over 40 years of faithfully serving God, not one prophetic word failed to be fulfilled in her life. And he made this conclusion. He said, when all of your prophetic expectations have been met, it probably means your assignment is up. In other words, thank God for the promises you've got that haven't been fulfilled yet. Thank God for the frustrating promises and prophecies that are looming over your head that you wonder if they're ever going to happen. Those are your invitation to Rome in the middle of a shipwreck. Here's my message to you. You're carrying your future on the inside of you. How many of you would like to release the authorization of heaven to make sure your face makes it all the way to Rome. Well, some of you got that. Let me say it again. I found something out, my little Jewish background. You know, I've got an Ashkenazi Jewish heritage. I did a DNA test. I heard about my father was a, a long line of rabbis on my father's side. My dad was a bit of an irreverent fellow. He broke from the tradition. And uh, it was, I couldn't believe that I had a Jewish background. I looked it up, and sure enough, I've got family in Israel, and it's rabbis, of all things, Levites. So I took an interest in the Jewish part of my DNA, and it, and it took me to the book of Hebrews, and I found something out. It says something interesting here. It says that when Abraham went to war, that he went up against five kings, five kings that had taken his nephew hostage, you are at war for your family's sake. When I think about it, I'm not that politically passionate. I mean, I care about issues, but you want to really know what keeps me out at my retirement age, risking my life and making new enemies every day? What keeps me motivated is my children and now my grandchildren. Because I've had a good life and I cannot stand cowardless in my own life when I pull back from the conflict so that they have to face the demons I refuse to slay. Abraham went to war for the sake of his nephew. If you're like Abraham, then you're going to do this thing you've got to do in America for the sake of the family. Now, Abraham, after he takes on those five kings, has a sober morning. He took them on and beat them. But the next day, it was the realization, oh my gosh, have I made powerful enemies. You are making powerful enemies in America, by the way. And that was when he had God show up for him and reveal himself as his shield and his protection. That was when he met Melchizedek. In Hebrews chapter 7, this strange character suddenly steps out. He's only mentioned twice in the Bible. He steps out in history. You find out that after Abraham had accomplished his defeat of five kings, he's nervous about how he with 318 people is going to possibly deal with retribution once they get organized. He did a night raid. This is when he runs into Melchizedek. The Bible kind of clearly says this is a priest, an unusual priest. He was a king and a priest. He was both a ruler and a priest, a strange alchemy. And uh, he has no lineage. He had no beginning, had no end. And that's why many theologians believe this isn't Seth or one of the sons of Noah. This was a theophany or what you could say is one of the rare appearances of Jesus showing up in the Old Testament. Why would that be the case? He meets Abraham. And he blesses Abraham, the friend of God, the man closest to God on the earth. And the Bible says clearly the greater blesses the lesser. So whoever this guy was, he was greater than Abraham, the friend of God. And Abraham gives him an offering. Why would Abraham give him an offering? Because the Jewish people, before tithing was written into our law by Moses, they had the sense to know, I'm going to connect something I've got of value with something I see of value. I will take what is important to me and invest it in that which is divine. He recognized in Melchizedek a king and a priest, someone who represented the God that he was submitted to, and so he gives him a tithe of, of, of his combat, 10% turns the rest of it over to the king of Sodom. He didn't want to touch any of it, lest anyone say that anyone other than God made him wealthy. 
but he gave a tenth of the spoils to Melchizedek. And I read this, and here's the promise I want to give you. The Bible says in Hebrews that Abraham, this writer says, when he was giving this tithe to Melchizedek, Levi, his descendant, was in his loins. Levi was in the loins of Abraham when he made the offering. I'm going to tell you something. There are times when God calls people of faith to give an offering because what they're carrying will be birthed because of their obedience. Let me say it again. There are times when the future you're carrying, the Levi that's in your loins, not just the next generation, it was Isaac, it was Jacob's son. We're going down, the generational future of Abraham was in his loins and he connected his offering to his future. America needs believers who have the hardiness to say, we're going to stay on board the ship, not wig out, freak out, or break down, or, or backslide. We're going to stay in position because we have an unfinished assignment. This gospel of the kingdom shall be taken into all the world and preached, and then shall the end come. And the United States is still, to this day, the greatest, most powerful missionary, electronic, televised, financial support of the global work of the church. You've got more not you've got more nations praying for America's election than you have evangelicals praying for it. Because the world knows what's happening in America will affect them. So I expect divine intervention, but here's what I'm telling you. Your future, your face is in Rome, like Paul's. The shipwreck can be averted. The disaster can be overruled. A nation of bad decisions who deserve a shipwreck can be saved because of your unfinished assignment. But there are times when you and I have to recognize, how in the world do I connect with my unmanifest future? How do I connect with that which I'm carrying so that it doesn't sink in a shipwreck, but it actually shows up and we find out in the Bible, Abraham, when he gave the offering to God, was connecting his future with what he was giving. Let's pray. Father, I pray right now that everyone here and watching will sense this is not a usual, typical offering. I never take offerings at Flashpoint. It's the first time. But I'm taking it now because I want this offering to connect everyone listening to the future. This offering, I pray, will come from you in such a way that it will connect with God, the king and the priest, and that God as the ultimate ruler and the ultimate rabbi will see this offering and connect you to it and take you through America's storm and into your future. Father, speak to the people what you want them to give. And if you're watching, I pray, don't skip this moment. Text F-L-A-S-H, flash, to 36609. Or if you're old school like me, you can call 877-281-6297. In the room right now, put your hand up. This is a sacred moment. We've got like three minutes. The glory of God's in here right now. Put your hand up and get an offering envelope. If you're making out a check here, just make it out the flashpoint. That's all you got to do, make the check out the flashpoint. If you're online, govictory.com forward slash FP give. That's govictory.com forward slash FP give. And once again, you can just text flash. Text flash, kind of like the Marvel character, to 36609. And I feel the presence of God is in the offering. I really do. God wants this offering to be a supernatural offering tonight that will connect you through the storm all the way to Malta on the other side because they're sailing with us. They're sailing with the church. They don't know it yet, but America's destiny is sailing with the unfinished assignment on a new apostolic generation of Christians in America. And the nations are praying that you be strong. I thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Once again, call 
Be patient if the line's busy. Don't miss the moment. 877-281-6297. Because the future is your Levi is in your loins and your giving connects your future to the offer. And God births something out of you because you're connected to the supernatural God. In the name of Jesus. All right, hold up your offering. And I say, Father, in Jesus' name, if you're in the room right now, Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you to bless this seed. And may it go into the air. May it go to the nations. And may it go to the raising up of a great army of patriots. That these gatherings that we're doing will increase and grow and multiply in power and scope. And it will have an effect on the future of the United States and the nations. In Jesus' name. Because there's something about your church and the number of people that have, you know, with a pastor land and shot, have, you guys are really affecting Fort Worth. Yeah. You're not just preaching the gospel, which you are, and you're feeding the hungry, and you're, oh my gosh, so many things. But you guys really motivated your, your church people and the community to go make a difference. Talk a little bit about that. Well, I, I think everyone would agree in this room, and I believe the pastor of this church is exhibiting this perfectly, and that is that the world doesn't need any more nice guys. We need warriors that are willing to stand up for our values. Do you believe that in this room? And. You know, our pastor and um, our church rallied around the idea that it's very simple. Either culture can change the church or the church can change culture. What is going to happen? And I believe we're called to be the change in the culture. Mm -hmm. And so looking at that, you know, what we did was uh, we felt like we were called to run for office and, you know, for so long, this Johnson Amendment has hung over pastors' heads, oh, which essentially just says, hey, we're going to take away your tax status. And our pastor uh, just kind of said, IRS, uh, come on. Uh, you know, what, what are we worried about? At the end of the day, doesn't Christ build his church, not the IRS? Uh, doesn't Christ build his church, not the government? And, um, and so our pastor got really bold and just said, Nate, we're going to get behind you. And on stage, he endorsed me personally from the stage and just said, as for us, we're going to stand with those who stand with Christ and stand for righteous change in our nation. And, um, and what we saw was absolutely unbelievable, Gene, as literally 17% of the voters that came out to vote for me had never voted before an election in their entire life. And we saw churches around Fort Worth jump into the race and start block walking hundreds of volunteers um, and just jump in. And about that time, you know, I was polling at uh, 10%, which for anyone in here, I don't know if you know this, but that's 90% of people aren't voting for me. And uh, I had no shot, no shot at winning. You know, I was going against two career politicians, and I'll never forget this moment where I was going through Austin in our capital, and uh, there's not many good reasons to go to Austin, by the way. If you love Lubbock, you know that. And, um, and I was meeting with the lobby, and you know, I'm not very popular with the lobby, uh, because when they sit down and say, what do you wanna do? You know, they're expecting, a, we want a business-friendly state, and we want this, and I'm like, I wanna end the sexualization of children. I wanna make sure abortion is over in the state of Texas. I want to get sexual indoctrination out of our classrooms and get back to educating students. And uh, they don't like that answer like y'all do. And, you know, I was walking through the Capitol and I got all these meetings with lobbyists and no one was giving me any support or anything like that, polling at 10%. And I heard the Holy Spirit say this. He just simply says, Nate, he said, walk around the Capitol seven times with your shoes off and shout. Whoa. And... How'd you do it? And I said, Lord, I literally, I was in my truck and I said, Lord, that's weird. It is. Even for Austin, that's weird. <laughs> and, you know, and, and I did it. And as I was walking around with no shoes on, looking crazy, I was praying. And I'll never forget the prayers that I said. Um, I started praying and declaring the things that I believed would happen if God gave me victory. But one of the first things I said is, Lord, if you give me this seat, it'll never be mine. It'll always be yours. And right, well, let, I, me, let me interrupt you. Now, before you ran, is this like been a life's desire to be in politics? No, no. I was a youth pastor. These are the loosest pair of jeans that I own. You I know. know. I'm like and, crazy. 
And it was so funny, I didn't even own a suit when I announced. And, you know, we had not won any races in Tarrant County of the people we had endorsed or, or really gotten behind. And So wait a minute, all right, let's go back. You know, you're, you're stuck on skinny jeans there, but yeah. I, I want... So you had no desire, and you're going to a church, and the pastor says, basically, the IRS, bring it on. And so tell me about that moment that you went, you know what? I think I'm going to run. Yeah, you know, I... Uh, it was no, a, don't go too fast. Yeah. Because totally. I want to make I'll a point here. Yeah. I think as we were praying in ministry, I was out on a jog one day um, trying to lose my dad bod for my wife, you know. And, uh, and as I was jogging, I heard uh, the sound of a baby crying. And I took out my headphones and I looked around on this trail and I couldn't find anything. And I thought, you know, I'm just going crazy. I put my headphones back in about a mile down the road. I hear it again and I realize immediately that this was spiritual. And I heard the Holy Spirit say so clearly, um, run, or that's the sound of the babies that will never live if you don't create policies to protect them. Wow. And I approached this with my pastor, and I said, I don't, I don't know what this means. I, you know, I, I feel like I'm supposed to run. And he, he said, you know, let's pray about it. And he took it to our elders, and our elders came back. My pastor looked at me, and he just goes, you know, he said, uh, what, would I t what would you do? Um, we just launched an initiative to try and raise people up to run for office. And he said, what, would if, what if I told you I don't feel like this is your time? That the elders felt like, you know, let's hold back. Let's build a coalition. And then we do it in the future. And I was like, that's great. The Lord told me to submit to what my pastor said. I said, absolutely. And he looked at me and goes, great. I was just seeing if you were submitted. We didn't hear that. We feel like you're supposed to run. <laughs> and... <laughs> And so we ran and we won by the largest margin in the state by 30 points. And so, but here was the beautiful thing. And this is really coming back to your original question. Right, right, go ahead. And uh, it started a movement of people in our community and other churches around Fort Worth saying, you know what, maybe we should jump into this. And over the course, and this is insane, over the course of the last two years, we've raised up and supported over 60 people that have taken public office in Tarrant County, Texas alone. In school boards, in city councils, and boards of the city. Wow. And uh, it's been unbelievable. In fact, on, on May the 6th at our municipal elections, we were backing uh, 18 candidates for local municipal elections, and I'm happy to say 17 of them just won. And these are godly, righteous individuals. The message is simple. I, I felt like when I was praying through how to launch, and our initiative is called For Liberty and Justice, where yes. we partner with churches to mobilize the church and raise up godly candidates to take office. And I felt like when, we, when I was praying, the Lord said something so clearly. He said, I'm not looking for people who have their ear to the ground. In other words, I'm not looking for people who know what's going on in current events. I'm looking for people who have their ears to the clouds and listening for me. Wow, and I believe good. he's qualifying the unqualified. He's raising up godly men and women that have no background in politics to come in and That's disrupt it. this system and bring righteousness back to our nation. Man, that's so good. You know, and we, we have, of course, now we have history of you doing that. But we have a guy that was a businessman that ran and won a big seat and uh, had no experience in politics. Just so a little bit big. A little, a, a larger seat. Are y'all here? Is anybody in the room? Okay. It's a tough crowd sometimes. Isn't it? Uh, so uh, the point I want to make here is that you didn't know anything like what most of us think about running for, like, well, I, don't, I don't even know how government works. Yeah. I mean, I know a little bit, but I don't even know how it all works. But yet you did it anyway. You said yes to God, yeah. and you did it anyway. Yes. I think that deserves a hand, don't you? Amen. All right. So I, my next question, uh, Nate, what is, now that you've been there for a while, what's your biggest concern about Texas in the House? I think if we're not careful, we will allow fear to tell us that being a Christian means that we're timid. And one of the things that I've seen in Texas specifically, and I know Rick can speak to this in his time uh, working in Texas politics, is that in the name of Jesus, I see men and women shrink back in order to be nice rather than to fight for our values. And 
I'm here to tell you that wow. the Holy Spirit is not raising up nice men and women. He's raising up fighters that are willing to separate the wheat from the chaff, throw their reputation to the wind, and say, if I perish, I perish. Yeah. This is a time to fight. You know, nowhere in the scriptures, in the Old Testament or the New Testament, do you see men of, and women of God shrink back in order to be nice. In fact, nice is not one of the fruits of the Spirit. And so, and I love, I love... I love to remind my wife of that when she says I'm being mean, and then I, I apologize and say, yeah. you're right. And, uh, uh, but I always look back at these moments where, especially in the Texas house, where um, I see two massive problems. And one of them is not realizing that the Holy Spirit actually gives you the strength to be bold and not worry about your reputation. And the second issue that we see is we see this high level of corruption and greed, what, I, you know, what the Bible calls the spirit of mammon, right. where we're controlled by money. And you know, most people think cutting taxes is not spiritual. But I'm here to tell you that freedom is God's idea, not man's idea. And if we don't fight for the freedoms and liberties, even down to the economic freedom in Texas, then we're going to see a totalitarian state that takes away the rights of our people and takes away the rights of the church. And so what I see is a void in Texas, and, and a remnant is rising, like Rick said, but I see a void of people um, who are willing to not just stand for truth, but are willing to speak the truth publicly. And, you know, the greatest disinfectant is sunlight. And, you know, we have this obligation as believers that when we get into office to start pointing at things and saying, wait a second, we're the state of Texas. We should be leading on ender, ending gender mutilation for minors across yeah. the country. Yeah. We're the state of Texas. We should have the most religiously free state in America. That's right. We're the state of Texas. We should be ending the abortion pill and making sure that the unborn have the same rights as every fully grown person. And, you know, I've heard a lot of conversation about, um, you know, Nate, I'll be honest with you, this abortion thing, it doesn't poll really well. Well, if I was concerned about polling, I'd have never ran for office. Right. I'm concerned about being judged when I walk into heaven's Come gates. On. That's because it. I'm not going to answer for whether I got a vote. I'm going to answer for whether I spoke up for those who couldn't speak for themselves. And so this is absolutely the hill we have to die on, um, is fighting for the unborn. And I think at the end of the day, when I look at Texas, we need bold and courageous mama bears and papa bears that are willing to stand up in ways that the good old boys club won't do because they've fallen into a spirit of mammon and they've fallen into a spirit of fear. Yeah. Wow. That's good. Okay, so last question before we got to end of the segment, but I, I want to understand people sitting out there, maybe they're not from Texas watching, and uh, they're going, man, that's great, but I don't live in Texas. W what do I do? What do people do here? Maybe, maybe they're not as young as you are. Maybe they're older, but they, there's still something they can do. What should we all take uh, now, and how can we get involved? In so I would say three things. Number one, you know, there's 90 million voting age Christians in America. Amen. 40 million of them are not even registered to vote. And then 15 million just chose not to this last election cycle. Uh, listen, if we got out the vote and just simply said, my vote counts, and every single time we pull a neighbor to the polls and vote for those that stand for righteousness, it matters. Um, so there's that. The second thing is, how many of you know that we are at risk of losing an election because it's stolen? And so we have to bring in election judges. You can volunteer to be an election judge and be out there um, and stand in the gap. And do they, and watch they train it. you? They tell you what to do and Absolutely. How to you know, at the end of the day, all we're looking for is transparency and right. making sure there. And here's the third thing. We need pastors to stop worrying about what the government can do to them and realize we live in the freest country in the history of the world. And hear me, if you're for afraid of the government coming in and taking away your tax status, I promise you this, if you don't take a stand today, you're going to lose it in 20 years anyway when the government starts shutting down churches. Listen, if they can shut down churches in 2020, they can do it at any time they want. It's time we rose up and said, nobody tells us what God has already commanded us, and that is to worship, to stand, and to speak truth. We are the church, and hear me, we need bold pastors more than that. We need bold congregants that are willing to not just go vote, but to volunteer. Volunteer on righteous men and women of God's campaigns. Get involved. It's the easiest thing in the world is to just give your yes. Nate Shatzline, everybody. Give him a hand.
That's it. Thanks, Nate. Thank you. You'll hear more from him in a minute. I love, I love that. I love the spirit. Of, don't you love that? And he, and he spoke about something that, that's so, uh, what you said there, Nate, about your polling. If you were paying attention to your polling, you would have never gone as far as you did. You would have stopped what you were doing because you didn't well out to give up. All right, so we're going to keep things moving. I want to bring in uh, my brother. We, we, are, we look alike in a lot of ways. He's from Chicago, Illinois, James Ward. New to Flashpoint tonight. Come on up, James. Love you, bro. All right, thank you so much. I think James is the more handsome of the two. So good to be with you, and um, really honored to be here. I just want to share something on my, my heart for a few moments, and uh, like uh, Brother Lance said, I have a secret session tomorrow, and we're going to deal with victim thinking. We're going to talk about victim thinking in America. All the DEI, CRT, ESG, all of that stuff is growing from victim, so victim soil, and we're going to deal with that in tomorrow's session. I just want to share something here with you. I want to, I want to, talk, to talk to you about... Um, five signs very quickly, uh, scriptural signs that Jesus gave concerning the end times. And this is something that, um, as Brother Tony said earlier, I'm from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I know how to smell a thunder, thunderstorm as well. There's a certain smell in the air, and the signs are clear that we are moving toward the day of the Lord. The person of the Holy Spirit, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, his ministry primarily is to prepare the church to become the bride of Christ. There's a big difference between the church and the ecclesia and the bride, which is the nymphae. We're going to talk about that. So uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 20 tells us, of course, that where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. If the Lord wanted you to be born in the year 620, you would have been born in 620. If he wanted you born in 1319, you would have been born in 1319. God sovereignly placed you and I here right now for such a time as this, and we are anointed, equipped, and the Lord has faith in us to be able to do what it is he's called us to do to see the kingdom of God advance in this generation. The Word of God tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, that when you see Representative Nate, when you think about other uh, politicians, I want you to know that you are a kingdom politician. The Word of God says in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, now then you are ambassadors. We are ambassadors for Christ. So every one of us here have been authorized by heaven to affect business and to exercise authority in the earth as though God were pleading through us with the world to be reconciled unto God. Both the word and the ministry of reconciliation and the keys of the kingdom have been given to the church. Only the church is authorized to bind and to loose and to mobilize heaven and the forces of reality in the earth. It's important for us to know when God created the world, in the beginning, God created. He made things natural. When God created, everything was natural. When man disobeyed God, everything became unnatural. It was different than what God intended. The purpose of the supernatural is to reverse the unnatural to simply bring things back to the, to the way that they are natural, the way that God intended them to do. And this is the time for the church to begin to operate in the supernatural power of God to undo the things that are unnatural that we're experiencing simply so that things can be natural the way that they are here on earth as it is in heaven. This is the time that for the past few weeks, the Lord has been speaking to me a simple phrase, God is spirit. God is spirit. And we must remember that God is spirit. Everybody say that with me. God is spirit. That's an important statement. Of course, the word tells us in John chapter 4, verse 23 and verse 24, it says that the time is coming and now is when the true worshipers will arise. And it says that the Father is looking for and seeking such to worship him, those who worship him in spirit and in truth. God is spirit. It's very important that Jesus tells Nicodemus in John chapter 3, of course, he says, if a man, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
We spent quite a minute, bit of time as the church talking about what it means to be born again. And being born again, of course, is important for us to be born into the family of God. I believe the church has been living in a time that we've only been seeing the kingdom of God as people who are born again. But Jesus makes another statement a few verses later, and he says, unless one is born of the flesh and born of the water and born of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And this is the time for the church to be born of the spirit to enter into the kingdom of God for us to begin to command the works of God here on the earth. There are five things that we need to remember when the word of God says that we're born of the spirit. Jesus talks in Matthew chapter 24 about signs of the end times. And again, it is the person of the Holy Spirit only who is able to prepare the church to become the bride of Christ for the coming of the Son of God. We're closer than we've ever been before. Jesus starts out in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 1 and verse 2, and the disciples are asking him, Lord, when are these things going to be? When are the end times going to come? Jesus begins by telling them, you see these stones representative of the temple? There's going to come a time when not one stone will be left upon another. And Jesus was telling them, take your faith and your trust out of what you see. Everything is going to change. Everything will shift in these United States of America. Of America, God has already started. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 26, the shaking. God promised that he would shake everything that can be shaken. So only the things that cannot be shaken will remain. And we have received the kingdom of God, which cannot be shaken. Therefore, with grace, let us enter into the kingdom of God. And so Jesus begins to give them five signs, which are very important concerning the end times. And we are living in those signs today. Number one, in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus tells them that the first sign was a time of apostasy. There was going to be a time of apostasy. We're living in that time right now that he says that we're to take heed that no one deceives you because many are going to come in my name to deceive many. He goes on to say that many false prophets are going to arise to deceive many. He says that many false Christs are going to arise, and I've told you these things beforehand. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, Paul tells us there, he says that even if an angel comes to preach another gospel, let him be accursed. If anyone preaches another gospel, we're seeing false Christ and false gospel preach today. The social justice gospel is a false gospel. DEI is a false gospel. The awakening move, the uh, awakening movement, as I call it, is a counterfeit revival. We need awakening, not awakening. The false gospel and the false social justice gospel is being preached. It's apostasy in the last days. The second sign that Jesus tells the church. He says there's going to be a time of anarchy. We're seeing that today. With the college campuses, with the rebellion, with the resistance we're seeing. We're seeing anarchy. I can tell you that's something that is very concerning during this time. We've talked about the end time purposes of God, which is eschatological. But there's also something happening today that is political with the rise of communism and socialism. But there's also an ideology that's rising today called Marxism. But there's also something theological that's happening. It's the rise of Islam in America. And only the church of Jesus Christ can stand up to preach the truth of God's word. Study the history of conquest. Study the history between Islam and Christianity and why the crusades were necessary. Read about uh, the year 632 with the rise of death of Muhammad and the rise of the Umayyad Empire and the Abbasid Empire, the Ottoman Empire. This is the time that the gospel must be preached and the church must stand to prevent a caliphate, to prevent the golden age of Islam. The third thing that Jesus said was going to happen in the last days is apathy, that people would lose love. There would be no love. The love of many would grow cold. It takes a loveless woman to abort her baby. This is the time when people are killing each other with no remorse because apathy has taken over in society today. It's one of the signs that we're seeing. He said there's also going to be affliction, the fourth side in the last days. There's going to be affliction when God's people will begin to experience great challenges and resistance. But Acts 14, 22 says that the apostles would go around the church 
encouraging the disciples, strengthening the souls of the disciples, reminding them to keep the faith and letting them know that it is through much tribulation that we will enter the kingdom of God. But the fifth sign is the greatest sign. He says, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations and then the end will come. When Jesus says that kingdom will rise against kingdom or ethnos will rise against ethnos, he's saying ethnicities, that Greek word is ethnos, ethnicities will rise against other ethnicities. But this gospel of the kingdom must be preached as a witness to all the ethnicities and then the end will come. When I talk about the change and the shift from the church to the bride, church, ecclesia, the coming together is not enough anymore. This is the time that the Spirit of God is raising up those who are born of the Spirit to perfect the bride of Christ and the bride of Christ shares in equal authority with the bridegroom and he is coming back for a church without spot, without wrinkle, a church that's been perfected, a church that has no blemish, that is operating in the fullness of the power of God. Be encouraged, church. The revival is not coming. It is already here. We are those who are born of the Spirit, and this is the time that we are going to see those who know their God will be strong and will do great exploits in the earth. We will do the greater works that Jesus said that we would do in the mighty name of Jesus. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise if you would. Praise the name of Jesus. Stay out here, Pastor. Yes, sir. Stay here. We're going to uh, give him a hand. Yeah, stand up. That's a good word right there. That's a real good word. I'm going to invite the whole panel to come back out as we wrap it up for tonight and talk. Are you beginning to see some of the depth you're getting here on Flashpoint at these events? We're going to, we're going to wrap this up with a panel. We're going to dive into some of the topics and we just for a few more minutes and we're going to let you go because you got to get here early in the morning and those of you watching on television you can still get here you can still get here and be a part all right so are you taking notes don't trust your future to your memory write it down <laughs> write it down there's been some great nuggets today that have come out of these speakers and I know you've enjoyed it and we've got more to come. All right, so let's welcome everybody back to the podium, back to the platform, I mean. Yeah, sure. You can take my chair. See, they're always trying to do something. Lance, you're wearing tennis shoes. Yes, Gene, I'm trying I'm, to keep up with your Elton John glasses. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, I'd have a long ways to go to go get there. <laughs> All right, so as we wrap up tonight, gentlemen, I, I want to talk about some of the things that are going on in our world. You guys have touched on it a little bit tonight already, but Rick, when we see what we're seeing with the justice system, whether it's Trump's documents, let's take that case first. All right, so here we have the, uh, the raid on Mar-a-Lago and they, you know, that famous picture of all the documents, you know, that are all spread out that went worldwide talking about, look at these, we found all these important documents and Trump's had, wasn't supposed to have. Well, he's a president, he could have them. Aside from that, they faked the documents and then they, the documents didn't match the cover pages that they were saying. Shouldn't this case be thrown out at this point, if it's been proven? It, it's, it shouldn't just be thrown out, they ought to be prosecuting the FBI. Good. I mean, that's, that's, that's obviously, that's obviously not going to happen with this DOJ that is, that is taken by the left. But Flashpoint was way ahead on this thing. We were saying two-tier justice system you know, right. three years ago or two years ago and, and, and talking about this. But I do want to point out we're here with a weaponized, not just the FBI, ATF and multiple federal agencies, even the education department, the federal department of education is weaponized. Um, so we've got all these weaponized agencies at the federal level literally living out tyranny in our country. But how did we get here? Exactly what Nate was talking about. The church being nice. People of faith being nice. Being unwilling to stand against evil when they saw it. And too often thinking, 
It won't happen to me. Well, if it's, if it's happening to a politician or it's happening to something, they probably deserve it or, or whatever. And we just played nice for, or we thought, oh, that's the justice system. You know, the Bible doesn't, isn't, I mean, we're just supposed to be Christians and stay over here in the church and not get involved. And even sometimes in our own kids or grandkids would want to go into the law. Yeah, don't, don't go into the law or, or politics. You know, if I want to be really proud of you, you, you need to be a pastor and, and, and you need to go into full-time ministry. The law and politics is ministry, and we need to be encouraging our young people to go into that arena. That's, wh that's why I, I'm, I don't even know how to describe this. I'm sitting out here w listening to Nate, and I'm just getting goosebumps. I mean, this is, I am so encouraged by the people that God is raising up right now and moving into positions of leadership in order to turn around, not just at the federal level, but at the, at the state level. This, he represents us as we've been moving into these tough times because we got soft, right, in the soft times. He represents that, that chance that I keep talking about at all these flashpoint events that perhaps we can interrupt the cycle and not have to live in tough times for a thousand years of darkness or multiple generations if enough godly men and women that will be tough right at the beginning of the tough times we can interrupt that and get back to good times. So I'm just, I'm thrilled, Gene, that you invited Nate. I'm thrilled that we have, he represents, uh, there's a lot more like him, but he represents what we need to turn this thing around. So let's talk about that, Lance. We've got, we've got a, see, when I have Lance beside me, I, I want to start talking like this. You know, Gene. You know, Lance. <laughs> exactly. I have something I want to say. Please, go ahead. Now, I, I know you might want to change the subject on me. So I, I want, I now I'm all stimulated by this subject. Go ahead. Okay. So I was thinking today, do you know we should be even more outraged? When we you realize be. they sat on these four cases for 30 months on purpose to orchestrate an assault that would humiliate Trump, break him down, make him a, a, a media convict, lock him up, and discourage his movement, they calculated in the Department of Justice, all the attorneys were able to meet and determine 30 months, we'll put it off, and we'll collide together and keep him off the campaign trail and lock him up and break his following during the six months of leading to the election. That infuriates me. Yeah. Well, Charles it, Manson yeah. had like 10 indictments against him. Donald Trump has 90. And you still have Americans, Christians, evangelicals that are like, well, we'll have to wait and see, see what happens, what, what the Stormy Daniels say. It's, it's, it's an it's a, it's a element of illiteracy on our part that we are not outraged and banging the drums right now. This is police state behavior already. All right, well, since you, I, that was the next thing I was gonna, actually going to ask you about this whole Stormy Daniels case, which I, I'm not sure that went the way they really hoped it would go. No, it went the way they hoped it would go. So here's the, here's the, because here's, it's, but don't you feel like they went too far? I no, mean, no, obviously the, they went too far. That's but even the, the now I'm going to go with another rant Come because on. the judge says, "All right, now we want to make sure we don't have any salacious details here in the court. We understand that defense, yes, sir. We're not Alvin Bragg's, yes, sir." Then the judge allows five hours of salacious details without one interruption. So, for the record, he says, "I don't want this thing to be." So you know why? The case has nothing to do with Stormy Daniels. The average, there again, the average Christian thinks, well, did he do something or didn't he? You know, Trump, he probably did. It's not about that. It's about a bookkeeping entry, whether the entry was logged in this category or that category. And if it was logged in the wrong category intentionally, then technically he got elected by switching categories. And so they want to try him on election interference by switching the category. What went wrong was when Hope Hicks was on. And they thought she was going to flip and say, yeah, he, he did pay, he, we knew about the check that he wrote to Stormy Daniels cost the election. And she was crying. This, this messed him up. And she said he, he wanted to write that check because he was the most worried about Melania and his, and his children. He wanted them to be proud of him, and he did not want this to come out. So she's in tears. So there, now that, that ought to give you an element of empathy for what the man's going through. But what really outrages me is they, this case could be done. I talked to attorneys. Within four days, you could decide whether or not it was an intentional bookkeeping manipulation. And then what's the consequence? It's really, it's, a, it's, what kind of a crime is it? Is it a lock you up crime? No. But here's what the judge is doing. He's going to drag it out over five weeks 
Why? So he could break down Trump, humiliate him in public, and force you guys to all digest the salacious, constant leaking that the media is working with, with the corrupt uh, Soros-funded DA, in order to break down the movement that he started. Uh, yeah, uh, Pastor James Ward, Dr. Ward, t weigh in on this. I want to hear from you. You're a pastor there in Chicago. Tell me. Yeah, I'll, I'll say quickly that I, I think the church needs to wake up. When we talk about abdicating responsibility, and this came up before, this is not even about Trump. This is about our children and our grandchildren. It's about a posterity. And when you, when you see what's happening in the universities, the students that you see that are outraged, again, not just eschatological with end-time prophecy and demonology, uh, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, not just the rise of socialism and communism, not just the rise of cultural Marxism. When you hear lesbian ladies tell you we are trained Marxists, believe them. When you hear them shouting, we are Hamas, death to America, believe them. And we crossed the line, I believe, in the last two weeks that when the Palestinian flag was raised on U.S. soil and the commander of chief did not, commander in chief did not rebuke that and did not, not come out and say that that is an existential threat to the existence of the United States of America. If you don't take it down, I will mobilize the armed forces as the five-star commanding general of the United States. I will, I will mobilize every resource to remove you. It's about our children and our grandchildren. And I think this is a time that as pastors, we've got to begin to help the body of Christ parse that this, again, is about evil in existence in the earth to rise above, even above the, the misunderstandings and the, sh the charades that we're seeing in the court system right now. We have that responsibility in terms of making disciples that are equipped to engage in the issues of our day. You touched on it a little bit, and I want to, I want to start with Lance. If we've, we're finished with that topic. We're going to another topic. Okay, I'm satisfied. Okay. <laughs> I was shocked, Lance, I know we talked about this on the show, but we'll do it again here. I was shocked, Lance, the first time after October 7th when I saw Palestinian flags in a demonstration in New York City. That's the first place I saw it. Yeah. And I was like, are you kidding me? Interesting. Are you ki and they were organized. Yeah. And they got snacks in the back. I mean, they got everything. And I'm like, there's no way a bunch of teenagers got this thing going, where would they buy Palestinian flags from? Where would they even get those? And the, and the tents. Huh? And the tents. And the tents, and they all look great. These guys have got a great budget. Yeah, there was then, a run the, on Walmart. And the really hilarious part is they got the, uh, the, the, the lady who, after they've just taken over one of the uh, administration buildings, uh, reading her statement, which was written by somebody for her, and then making the plea for uh, gluten-free food because they needed humanitarian <laughs> aid. <laughs> you talk about an out-of-touch, privileged generation yes. want, saying we need humanitarian aid, and the specifics of it had to be like gluten-free and certain vegan diets were required by the students. So what interesting data that I'm looking at, for real. So, so the stuff that I'm looking at is the, the, the breakdown of the percentages on the arrests. So 50% of the arrested are students. Strangely, the, the other half are not students, right. which means How they are activists. Happen? They aren't people that are sympathetic with the righteousness of the cause. They're opportunistic people on the payroll. Yeah. You right. do remember the summer of love, which we had leading up to the election, so that you had this organized militia of well, and you want to talk about infuriating? Oh, boy, this is going to get me going. We have a January 6 hearing right. on like a million people who are shofar blowing, no weapons, no limousines burnt, no police precincts on fire, just dumb enough to walk into the Capitol as the police let open the door and say, "Come on in." So you got grandmas getting ready to right. go to jail. You got our group over there. On the other side, you have no investigation whatsoever of. Uh, Two billion dollars worth of damage, 18 people killed, cops killed, and 200 cities that were on fire from organized left organizations, the same ones that are right now doing their warm-up act. Get this. The schools are closing down. That's why they're getting, they're beefing up and getting their engine ready because these 
These are the well-funded anarchy machines, and we know already that distribution of funding comes through Islamic organizations, Soros-funded, Tides-funded, Rockefeller directly, you know, indirectly. Gates stopped doing it six, you know, like a year ago, but basically who knows how else they're funding. It's the same donor organization. No investigation of the people that are actually taking down America. And I was thinking about the flag. You mentioned about the, the Palestinian flag. Do you remember all this screaming and kicking and screaming over the Confederate flag? Oh you would goodness. think the Democrats would be congruent at least right. and go after all the flags that aren't, aren't, aren't going to be uh, customary. But they're not going after this. You know why? Strangely enough, a lot of their big donors are behind the anarchy because they're Marxists and they want the destabilization of America and they see this as a methodology. What they're missing is, and it's, I think it's, it's in evidence of revival, that what they're doing is so out of pace with the, uh, the average American. This is not going over like the George Floyd riots. It isn't going over like the confusion at Charlottesville above the Confederate stuff. This is actually America, which is, it, it, it's not dumb. It gets educated. And we're looking at all this and saying, there's something very sick and unsettling about hatred of Jews and pro-Hamas support at the radical level of our children because the data says half of the people arrested are activists and funded and like 10% are faculty. Now your faculty is feeding the students that right. are showing up. I think, should Trump get elected, and I'm, I'm meeting with some of his people on this, one of the top priorities he's got is to assault the system, the accreditation of the universities that are actually poisoning America's youth. This is why Bonhoeffer's statement is appropriate for, for now. Silence in the face of evil is evil itself. We were silent, and the poison of this Marxism and Islam was poured in the minds of these kids for decades and decades and decades. These, prof these professors, uh, this, this faculty, this is not a new thing. It's been happening forever. So this is actually good that this is boiled over on the campuses because now we know. The fact that James would speak out against Islam right here tonight. We've been silent for too long about the things that have been destroying our country and undermining our country. And it's exactly what you were talking about in Psalm 78. Right there it says, the Ephraimites armed to the teeth ran from the battlefield. The church had everything it needed to keep America a great nation. And we ran from the battlefield because we weren't told the stories. We didn't know everything that you're talking about. Psalm 78 is the chapter for us right now in our nation. And, and it's changing. That shift that we talked about last fall uh, here on Flashpoint is happening. You, you see it in the, in the leaders that are being raised up and the pastors that are willing to speak against these things. But that the silence it, for so long is why we're seeing what we're seeing right now. And too many people thought it wouldn't happen to them. The reason we're so angry, I think Lance just channeled the frustration and the righteous anger that we all feel about what they're doing to Trump because we also know that it's happening to us. The grandma you're talking about, two weeks ago she was with us in Virginia Beach and I had her in my flash talk, Re Re Rebecca yeah. Lovrens, the praying grandma. Tomorrow you're going to hear from a young lady that same thing, the legal establishment going after her and the left trying to destroy her life simply for as a homeschool mom getting involved in supporting Trump in 2020. So we've got to recognize this is not just Trump on trial. It's the justice system on trial, and it's all of us. And we have what we need to restore it, but we cannot run from the battlefield. We're armed to the teeth with truth. We've got the truth. We've got the population on our side in this country. The numbers are with us. If we'll do what Nate said, get them registered and get them out to vote. Half of our people are not even on the battlefield. They've already run from the battlefield. So we need to go recruit them, train them, educate them, and then get them on the battlefield, which is voting and the, and the persuasion. It's an intellectual battle, just in case all those leftists out there that want to say that Gene and I are calling people to arms. It's intellectual <laughs> arms, intellectual ammunition, and we can win because we've got the truth. Go ahead, Tony. I know you're ready. I was thinking, as, as, as Rick was talking, I was thinking about the verse the Lord gave you, and I was thinking about how unique Flashpoint events are. I've never been a part of anything like this, um, where you, you, don't, you don't know if it's a revival service or a political rally or... Sometimes it's a healing service. Right. Last year in Pensacola, there's thousands of people laid out in the floor speaking. And a Methodist pastor came, got baptized in the Holy Ghost. You never know what's going to happen at a Flashpoint event. And 
God's given you a word about an outpouring. Lance brought up about the Holy Ghost. God gave me a word about rain. And Acts chapter 4, because I think this prayer of boldness, what, what Flashpoint is doing, will activate an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. They had been persecuted for preaching the truth. And they were brought before the rulers of the people. And the rulers were telling them, stop teaching in that name. Stop, stop meddling with the government. Stop doing what you're doing. And the apostles took a stand. They said, we, do you really think we're going to obey you rather than obey God? And the government came to the conclusion, we can't do anything with them. And it, it actually goes on to say, it's better that we not do anything because they might riot. They were scared of what the believers would do if they were persecuted. Right now, they're not scared of us. They think that if they persecute us, they're going to silence us. We need to get the church to a place where the world systems are intimidated by the strength of the church. And they say, you know what? We better not stir up that Flashpoint army again. Because Sean Foy and Eric, they'll go riot in Columbia University singing, How Great Is Our God. We better just leave them alone or they'll have another prayer rally. And, and it goes on. The, the prayer of the church in that hour, it's Acts chapter 4, verse uh, 28. It says, it says in, in the New Living Translation, it's actually called the Believer's Prayer for Courage. After all this had happened, verse 29, they prayed, O oh Lord, hear their threats and give us your servants great boldness. They prayed for boldness. And verse 31, after this prayer, the meeting place shook and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. That's what Flashpoint has been rallying the nation for for the last four years. Oh, God, give us boldness. And that prayer, I believe, is going to activate an outpouring of the Holy Ghost that rather than shake the room, is going to shake this nation with gospel and revival in the name of Jesus.